we'll begin, I'll talk a little bit about the different, what I see as the different categories of teenagers that we see at 15, 16, 18, up to 25. And I find that there are really three categories. And among those of you listening, I think you'll identify your child as being in one of these, or occasionally you'll see a little bit of a mixture. But the first one is the optimistic, the second is the terrified, and the third is the lost. And every week in my office, uh, I see one or two of each of these. It's a very critical group. In fact, once the book came out, I have had to limit the number of these cases I take because they are so plentiful. We hear from people all over the country now, parents as well as young people who are really struggling with some of these issues in one of those categories. So the first one, and perhaps for parents, it really is the most annoying of the three, is the optimistic teen. And, you know, you ask yourself, like, why would anybody find that annoying? Well, for kids with ADD, and for some of them that are on the autistic spectrum, this is true too, that their optimism is not hope. Hope is different, and we're going to talk about that later. Optimism doesn't have to be based on anything realistic. And so with the overly optimistic uh, ADD team, they have this uh, kind of overdeveloped sense of freedom that doesn't really match up to their actual independence skills. And they will have a tendency to want to hit the door at 18 um, like the proverbial bat out of hell. They just are certain that with their exuberance and their uh, great wisdom at 18 that they will be able to live their lives just as they see fit. But what they don't realize is the amount of independence that takes. And I always teach kids that, you know, the old little song, freedom isn't free, it really is quite expensive. And one of the things that can help with these kids, and believe you me, it is not a guarantee, but is to just really take them very seriously and to say, this is great, let me help you figure out how to make this all work. And so you sit them down and start walking through um, the budget and the costs. And I will say to you that Working this way requires you to believe in their authentic choice. And it is possible. I have done it. I do it all the time. It is possible for these kids to actually get out and um, make their way and earn a living or whatever they may wish to do. But it does require them to become more planful than they are used to being. And so if you really will work with them, you know, even if you don't think it's a very good idea, help them figure out, how to find that themselves. And the, you know, the sort of sad irony of this is you're kind of breaking their optimism. And that seems sad, but when you realize that sometimes their optimism is based only on exuberance and energy and not on uh, an understanding of the world, you realize why that's probably an important thing to do. So then we have the next group, and they are the terrified teens. And these guys are really, and girls are really the opposite of the optimistic ones. They uh, may feel very satisfied with their current situation, which means often living, you know, in the same room they've occupied since they were in kindergarten or uh, just staying at home. Kids that won't drive, we see a, a high number of kids with ADHD who just don't want to drive. My daughter is one of them. Uh, I never thought I would have to, like, Joel and pressure and threaten a teenager to want to drive, but we really have gotten to the point where we're saying you're not going to get to do things now that you're 18 that you would like to do because we're not going to tote you around anywhere. That's one example of the terrified teen. They just are so worried about their own shortcomings, whether it is uh, living on their own or driving or any other of the aspects of independence that most other kids hold so dear that they just sort of distance themselves from it. Now, Let's take a moment and think about this. Every problem in the world has its benefit, and every benefit has its flaw. So is it, a good, is it possible that the terrified teen knows something that we don't? For example, I don't know whether my daughter is going to be a very good driver, so perhaps her wisdom is great, and she wants to wait and let herself mature a little bit more before she gets behind the wheel. Or what we know from the research is that the optimistic teens who move out on their own and try to take the world on 
you know, grab it by the horns, tend to end up either in dire straits or living back at home. So for that group, they are jumping the gun. For the terrified teens, sometimes they are just letting themselves grow up a little more, and the literature often tells us that's a good idea. I'm sure most of you know that uh, most kids are at least two and a half years behind, kids that have ADD, are at least two and a half years behind in maturity. So to some degree, <clears throat> what the parent needs to do in this situation is, again, honor the terror and also push the child at just the right uh, speed to get out and try things. Again, since my daughter is practicing for graduation this week, instead of listening to this, I can use her as an example, and she told me I could. Um, we, she will do junior college for two years. I strongly recommend that for these kids that are a little worried about getting out in the world, a good quality junior college can make all the difference in the world. They can live at home, continue to get some of that support, but also be pushed out just a little into the world. We have already begun to look at bridge colleges for when she graduates from junior college and really are thinking, now, what kind of a dorm would be the best fit for her? And in general, for kids with ADD, it is dorms that are designed where you can have your own private room, not a big room, usually just enough for a bed. We have found a college like that. So things like this for the terrified teens makes it easier for them to think about transitioning maybe a couple of years down the road. I was very pleased walking off the campus that we went to the other day how excited my daughter was about the possibility of in a couple of years living away from home. That's been very carefully engineered to match the pushing and the holding, the sort of in, you know, helping her, embracing her, and nurturing her, and the pushing her out of the nest a little bit. So that's what you're looking for for the terrified group. Now, a minute ago, I said that the most uh, <laughs> the most annoying ones were the optimistic ones. I think some of the most difficult ADD teams to work with are the lost ones, and they are they are neither. Uh, pushed by the energy of their fears, nor particularly um, ready to go out and try things. And so they just tend to avoid this. For the therapist and for some, to some degree for the parent, these kids are marked by you say to them, so, Bill, you're 17, what do you think you might like to do after you finish college? Or I'm sorry, after you finish high school? And Bill says, I, I don't know. And you say, no, I don't mean, um, like, do you, do you want to be an engineer or a fireman? Do you, just, like, what are you thinking you might do the day after you graduate high school? I don't know. Have you thought perhaps you would like to go to, to a kind of college or trade school? I don't know. And you look in their eyes, and they're not being oppositional. They're not just deflecting you. And I've actually had some... Uh, it's more common with young men, believe it or not. I've had young men start to tear up in this situation, which is very unusual. Um, girls will tend instead, occasionally they just don't know, but instead they'll just change the subject. Guys, this becomes very emotional because in our society they're supposed to know things like this. And so this becomes the next dilemma that the parent, or in my case the therapist, has to deal with, is how do you help guide them without shaming them? without saying, dude, your whole class kind of knows they're going to at least do something in the few weeks and months after graduation, without making them feel really bad about that. And the consequence of leaving this sort of where it's at is you have a much higher likelihood that you're going to have kids living in the basement in perpetuity. Um, I've actually been thinking about doing a book called The Children Under the Stairs, the point of which would be uh, how many kids we have, many, many, many of them having ADHD or some similar issue who just cannot launch, uh, mostly young men at this point, who just cannot launch. And this usually starts off with them just being lost. Very tricky. So what is the, the magic sauce, the, 
the secret ingredient to fix everything. I always like those books, like, you know, 10, 10 Steps to Nirvana or something. Well, I don't have that for you, but uh, the thing that is most helpful for each of these kids is to develop hope. And hope is not an ethereal construct. Uh, my, one of my professors at the University of Kansas is world famous. He uh, has passed away since, but he, he was world famous for building an actual psychological construct around hope. His name was uh, C.R. Snyder, and one of his students who was a peer of mine is Shane Lopez, and he recently wrote a really good book about hope. So if you look on Amazon, those are available. And the idea of hope is not that it is optimism. Uh, it, hope is made up of two constructs. Willpower, which means how we think about our goals. Do we have a plan? Um, or I'm sorry, do, uh, how we think about our goals and the energy we put into actually pursuing them. That's the willpower. That's the thing that gets us to get up every day and take the next step. And way power, which is our mental plan about our goals. How do we see the end result? Now, this is very tricky for folks with ADHD. I've done this for 23 years and I've seen about 24,000 hours worth of clients, and many, many, many of them have ADHD. And what I've learned is that kids and adults with ADHD do not want the same way as the rest of us do. When I think about, I'd like to get a PhD in psychology, I go to the library, I was in Wichita, Kansas at the time, and I went to the Wichita State Library, and I studied intensely to find out what, what do these people with PhDs in psychology do to get them? How does this happen? And uh, you know, what, what kind of flavors of psychology? Where do you have to go to get these things? And I remember sitting there hours and hours and poring over these uh, books. You know, we had books in those days. We didn't know there was an Internet in the future. And uh, I found answers there. And so that was my, my mental plan. And then my willpower was to take the energy to get up and to go through these things step by step in an organized fashion. I had to finish a master's degree, which I had not yet started. I had to do a thesis in order to excite graduate schools to let me in. I had to take the GRE. If you've ever done that, that's a blast, which meant I had to teach myself all of the algebra that I had not taken in college. And I didn't even have YouTube to do it. It was painful. So... All of those were the steps I had to lay out meticulously to get to my goal, and it worked. For young people with ADHD, this is very hard because to want is to do that thing I just described. Too often what we see with the ADHD kids is that they have wanting as wish fulfillment, meaning that you sort of, it's a sort of fantasy, like, gosh, I'd like to have a PhD someday right alongside with the sense, but that will never happen. And that is, the, that is a sense of hopelessness. And this can get uh, so serious, very commonly, it can get so serious that you will get kids to despair and self-harm. And when we are really pushing a kid who's stuck under the stairs to get out on his own and to be more self-sufficient, we always, it's always implicit in that plan, and everyone knows it in the room, that we have to guard against self-harm, suicidality, both as a threat and as an actual incident. And it's one of those things that no one ever questions. The parent will, will say it or I will say it to them, are you worried about self-harm? This is a failure, uh, the ultimate failure of hope. So with that great idea, how do we become more hopeful? How do we develop a more hopeful perspective? There are some real steps you can do. I kind of gave some examples when I told my little doctoral story. But it doesn't have to be that grand. It can be whether you're going to overhaul the engine in a car or you're going to write a book or you're going to um, ask a girl out on a date or a boy. And so you go through, and we do this I saw every day of the week. It's uh, just a, a process. So the first thing is you brainstorm, you know, what, is the, what are the possibilities? Um, should I get a PhD or a master's degree or should I ask out, a, you know, in today's world, you decide whether you're 
sexual identity is gay or straight or bisexual or pansexual. You're actually just sort of coming up with all these different ideas. Am I going to ask the girl out or the guy out or am I going to, uh, am I too afraid to do that? What will happen if they say no? Whatever the problem is, you're brainstorming all of these possibilities and usually with a friend or a mentor or a therapist or a parent. Then you have to determine is the goal attainable? Am I able to score high enough on the GRE? Am I smart enough to go to doctoral school? Actually, to be honest with you, you don't have to be that smart. You just have to be really tenacious. You have to hang in there. And you have to ask yourself, can I do that? Um, is the person I'm interested in dating um, in my attraction profile? Do I have a shot at that? It's a question you have to ask yourself. Um, do I want to be? What kind of relationship do I want to be in? Whatever the, the goal is, is can I do it? And you have to do a fair assessment of that. As you can imagine, the overly optimistic teens are quite certain they can do anything. You know, they're going to be on American Idol or play for the NBA, even though they're five foot eight or something. Um, you've got to think what is doable. And one of the mistakes in our society that we have made over the years is this idea that, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to. That's not a good coaching strategy for a teenager. It isn't the truth. And one of the things in these situations we always want to do is tell the truth and tell it kindly and when it's necessary. And so it, once you've kind of decided, yeah, this is within the range, and you can stretch yourself. You can try harder than you think you can do, but it's got to be in the range. Then you do the cost-benefit analysis. If I win this, if I do it, if I get this person to go out with me, if I get a PhD, is the benefit going to be worth the cost? Nowhere is this more important nowadays than in determining how much student loan debt to carry. And for a lot of young adults, the worst outcome is you have $75,000 in student loan debt and you drop out of school. That's the worst case scenario. But there are many others. If I get a degree in, I don't know, look up the top 10 worst degrees to get on Forbes. There are 10 on there. If I get one of those degrees and I have $100,000 in student loan debt and my salary is $32,000 a year for the next 10 years, is the benefit going to outweigh uh, the cost? Talking to kids about this in those terms is very helpful. If I move into an apartment, I'm giving up all this money that I could put into something else, is that a good choice? Kids may decide it is, but they've got to start thinking in terms of cost-benefit. All, as I said earlier, all choices have to be authentic. The more parents try to make the choice for the child at this age, the more likely the child is going to make an inauthentic choice, meaning they pull against the parent whether that's a good idea or not. Our whole book, Consent-Based Sex Education, is based on that very theory. Um, one of the mistakes people make with ADHD in making decisions is to make things more complicated than there are. Now, it sounds like I'm making this super complicated and I don't mean it to be, but it, it is very easy to take a simple problem and turn it into a mind-boggling mess. Um, help kids to get it down to the bare elements. Uh, we always say that every decision is actually a binary decision, yes or no. It may take a hundred of those binary decisions, but each one is made yes or no. Um, one of my favorites, uh, Master Yoda tells us to do or do not, there is no try. And so I tell kids in my office, you're not allowed to use the words try or want. You have to tell me what you're going to do. And it's very funny. You'd be shocked how well this works. I will have kids in the middle of something. We haven't talked about this in weeks. And the kid will be like, well, okay, I'm going to try to study for the... Uh, 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 I mean, I'm going to study for the GRE. <laughs> they get why this is important. It's a reason why that quote from Yoda is so popular. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, determining if a goal is attainable. This also has to do with finding your limits. And then once you know your limits, how much can you stretch them? How much farther can you go? Pace is important. I get so many ADD kids in here who have this urgency. <laughs> I've got to get through nursing school in a year, you know, or whatever. And the, in fact, for kids with ADHD, it sometimes takes longer. You may need to be a five-year college student, or you may need to take three years in trade school instead of two. Pacing is critical. It's better to take six years to graduate from college than to fail in four. And this is just one of those things with these young people. We want to give them a little more time and perhaps push them every day of the week a little 
less so than we might otherwise do. And I always tell people you cannot alter your life when you are yourself altered. Alcohol and substance abuse do not improve decision making. Today our dear young people are quite convinced that smoking a lot of weed is a very helpful tool in a higher consciousness and I try to help them think differently about that. Um, a lot of these uh, will go better if you hook your young person up with a mentor. doesn't have to be a therapist. I obviously think that's a neat idea. Um, it could be a coach. It could be a teacher. It could be an adult friend. Um, somebody who, who maybe has had ADHD or exposure to it that can help uh, find all the little peccadillas that come with it and, and work through it. And a lot of these we've talked about, the, you can kind of go back through the slides. I probably should have advanced them as I was going. I was enjoying um, talking about them and not pushing the button. But each of these are things we've discussed. And oh, this is a good one. When a young person does well, one of the great things our phones do now is take pictures and document uh, things we have done. And we make fun of this a lot, that kids love to take pictures of everything, especially themselves. You know, for kids with ADHD, making sure they get pictures of things they're doing well and taking pictures of those or tweeting about it or whatever, that can be a pretty neat thing. It's so often that one struggles and struggles with something that they want to be reminded of things they did well. And it, it's very true that that kind of encouragement as opposed to praise. If you just praise somebody every five minutes, it doesn't mean anything. But when you're really encouraging them and documenting something that really was successful, it can be very helpful when the chips are down. Mm -hmm.